Okay. Uh, so okay. Um, but um, I would like to um, tell you some like general um, general issues connected to this like very fascinating but still very much under researched uh, topic of man migrations and masculinity. Uh, it's still not there. You can share. Um, no one. Okay, so I, I can see that, so I will just simply uh, start talking. So um, we all know that a uh, majority of migrants are men. Uh, it's been like that since the beginning of the history of um, mm, civilization, and uh, until today, uh, this particular uh, um, balance in genders when it comes to like transnational immigrations especially, didn't change. So that's the one of the most important um, result of like so like uh, contemporary like migration studies uh, that men are still like dominating in like transnational migration processes and uh, it is also connected to the fact that in the classic migration studies migrant men are usually the main subject of analysis but uh, in the same time uh, some uh, scientists actually pointed out that in contemporary migration studies we are facing very specific paradox. Migrant men are still over research as like normative migrants, so migrants without any genders, and yet they are very much understudied uh, when it comes to like gender perspectives and studying like migration from like masculinity, gender, and um, non-universal uh, perspective. And uh, until today, majority of analyses that taking into account gender perspective in the migration studies mostly focuses on women, and only recently, at the beginning of 21st century, men started to be seen as a subject of uh, migration studies conducted from the gender um, perspective. Um, when we are talking about uh, transnational migrations, it is really important to actually distinguish that it's not like a homogenic um, category, and transnational migrations can be very much different because they can happen in like, different circumstances and different types of actors are also engaged in certain types of like migration processes. So we are talking about intercontinental migration and we can talk about migration from developing to more developed countries, but at the same time there are also migration processes which are, um, which are happening uh, with the involvement of actors who actually migrate from developed countries to developing countries. Uh, of course, we can talk about uh, voluntary migration, voluntary transnational migrations, but also forced transnational migrations. And uh, in terms of like intracontinental migrations, there are also differences. And for example, European Union and European Union mobility is rather important type of migration, which also have very specific character, which is different than like majority of transnational migrations in general. Uh, of course, we have also like local migrations, which are not transnational, and the most typical uh, type of local migration is obviously rural to urban migration. So the first thing is to uh, take under consideration the fact that we are when we are talking about international migrations, we can talk about very different processes with very different actors engaged and with very different like results that this kind of migration men may um, um, have in like selective societies or um, cultural contexts. So uh, very important questions when we are talking about masculinities and migrations is the very simple question Yes, uh, who are migrant men? Um, Jeff Hearn said in his uh, latest book about transnational migrations and transnational uh, global masculinities that women, men, and father genders are likely to experience migrations, immigrations, and immigrations in different ways. But the point is that the differences in experiencing migrations are not only between genders, they are also like in the same group of one gender, mainly men. Because as we all know, I'm sure this is not a novelty for all of you, migrant men are not homogeneous group, and of course they have differ. We have like refugees, we have like asylum seekers, we have like, I don't know, labor migrants in uh, United uh, European Union, 
And we also have some sort of like a category which is called like expats. So the experiences of this different type of migrants are completely different and the experiences that might shape the type of masculinities that they perform or represent also different uh, tremendously. And of course the differences are connected to such as factors as class, ethnicity, citizen status, uh, age, sexualities, disability, etc., etc. And they also result in different perceptions regarding gender roles, regarding gender equality, and also different understandings and performances of masculinities. So uh, my plan was to just briefly um, uh, present you like three typically um, analyzed types of migrants, and one of them is of course uh, refugees and asylum seekers, because this topic, especially in the connection to masculinity and, uh, uh, well, especially like in the connection to toxic and dangerous masculinity is very much discussed recently in Europe, and it's not surprising uh, in the context of uh, the mi so-called migration crisis that Europe has been facing since 2015. So these are like several um, statistics. You can see that in Sweden, for example, the number of migrants, uh, especially in 2015, is really high. And um, majority of these migrants, 60%, according to like data from the beginning of 2017, are men and boys. And they come mostly from countries like uh, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Turkey, and the rest are like men who are actually do not have any citizenship. And the situation in Germany is almost exactly the same, although the numbers are bigger, because it's a bigger country. So 2015, 2016, enormous number of uh, newly arrived uh, refugees who actually applied for the asylum status in Germany was identified in this country. And again, very similarly to, um, to the Swedish situation, 64% of men and boys, uh, there are 64% of them are men and boys. And the country representation is almost you cannot see that, but it's almost the same like uh, in Sweden. So it's like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Iran, Eritrea, and several other uh, African countries. Uh, but what was the result of uh, this like, well, quite a large number of men and boys from non-European countries coming to European Union recently? So the result is that, well, first of all, there are like very different um, discussions, mostly in media, about the meaning of um, the situation and uh, what does it mean for like European uh, values, what does it mean to European value of gender equality if so many men with presumably different types of masculinities and different types of values when it comes to gender equality are coming to the country. So uh, several studies already analyzed the media discussions about like foreign masculinity, foreign refugees from masculinity, and the main results are not really surprising and also not really optimistic because obviously the refugee's masculinity has been identified as the other masculinity. And at the beginning of, um, of the migration crisis, uh, Paul Scheibelhofer, who is a masculine, men and masculinity and migration researcher from Austria, observed uh, some sort of transformation of images of male refugees. So at the beginning there was like compassion and empathy, but uh, very quickly it transformed into um, imagination of uh, refugees' um, masculinity as a foreign and dangerous type of masculinity. So what is happening in the media discourses right now in majority of countries where the problem of large amount of, well, not the problem, challenge of large amount of uh, refugees from, um, from uh, Arabic countries appeared, there is a huge discussion about, from one side, hyper-masculinization of this kind of men and blaming them for like performing the most dangerous and the most toxic form of masculinity, which is so much different than European masculinities, obviously. Uh, but it also turned into like demasculinization of this man, especially in the context of the institutionalization of like refugee politics. So this is another paradox. On the one hand, they have been, uh, they have been um, uh, seen as a like hypermasculine, but also like um, the fact that they are not able to make decisions about their own life whenever they are in the country of um, 
of asylum also make them uh, make them being seen as like a non men enough in a sense of like decision making process. Uh, when it comes to um, real research about like newly arrived refugees masculinities, there is not much uh, we can actually see or read right now. And therefore, whenever uh, we really want to um, get familiar with the scientific uh, analysis of like masculinity, which can be represented by newly arrived refugees from certain regions, we should go and read the studies which has been made in this particular region. So for example, um, when it comes to men and masculinities from like MENA regions, recently they have been published like very great report uh, uh, about like gender perceptions of masculinity and gender equality and so on in this particular region. And these are information which are actually can shed some light on certain types of masculinities, certain types of gender identities which might be performed and uh, among newly arrived refugees in Europe and uh, about, well, different types of like perceptions regarding gender equality as well. Um, so this is like the first type of uh, migrant masculinity, the most discussed one, but still very much under-researched. Uh, the second type of uh, migrant masculinity uh, is represented by, for example, Polish migrants in, uh, United, in um, United Europe, European Union. Um, so as you probably also know, uh, Polish migration is, is huge and since uh, 2004 um, there has been like more than 2 million people migrated from Poland to other European countries. I'm one of them as well, but I'm not a man, so I'm not really discussing my case. Uh, so the Polish migrant man is also like very um, interesting um, type of, I don't know, image I would say. Because unlike uh, refugee masculinity and refugee men, Polish migrant men are desirable labor migrants because they are white, they are European, and I don't know why, there is this, uh, well, there is this saying that they are hardworking people. And um, therefore, uh, migrants from Poland have completely different status when it comes to um, comparison between them and, for example, uh, newly arrived refugees. So on the one hand, um, they are much more respected and they are much more desirable and uh, they can uh, actually realize their, their well, typical masculine role, mainly breadwinner role, because like the money they are earning abroad or sending to, uh, to the to their, um, home country and it it reinforces uh, the hegemonic status of their masculinity in the country, in the family, in the uh, close circle of, of friends and relatives. Uh, in the same time, uh, they are facing some sort of discrimination in an external context, in the context of the hosting country. And therefore, in the case of Polish migrants, we can observe very peculiar ambivalence of privilege. So, for example, they are privileged because they are European Union citizens, but on the other hand, they are from Eastern Europe and they are still ranked as lower in terms of like status in the countries that they are actually working in. Uh, the last type of masculinities, uh, migrant masculinities, transnational migrant masculinity, are people, in this case men, uh, which are called expats. I personally hate this word because it doesn't really express anything. But expats are um, defined by some researchers as the cosmopolitan commuters who tend to be Western and professional uh, Eurostars. So one of the cases of expats uh, that I've been researching uh, recently uh, were men who belong to the community which is called third culture kids. And third culture kids are people uh, who are moving internationally mostly when they were children because of uh, their parents' work in different uh, countries all over the world. And in case of this man, um, mobility very strongly influenced their status, but of course in a positive way. Uh, when they were children, uh, they were uh, of course constructing certain type of gender equality, 
of gender identity, sorry, and masculinity, of course, as well, and having a status of like expat, transnational, Western or European citizen uh, shaped their masculinity in a very special way. They actually were able to build some sort of like a bridge between a hegemonic and hybrid masculinity. And it was strongly connected, of course, to the fact that their class and ethnicity and citizenship status were very uh, characteristic. And, um, and in this particular case, like migration and mobility gives them like much more privileges than they would have if they would stay in, their, um, uh, in the country of the parents' um, origin. So the conclusion is that um, whenever we are talking about transnational migrations and um, men and masculinities and gender identities, uh, we need to use the spatially intersectional um, perspective because uh, spatial belonging is an integral component of social embodiment and class status, providing also for a more holistic interpretation of gender hierarchies. Because when we are talking about men and migration, and masculinities, we talk about power relations and about hierarchies from the beginning to the end. And so, so social spatial locations are tied to the ever important notion of hegemonic masculinity, which also is the beginning of like discussion about like different types of hierarchies and different types of power relations between men. And um, as I said already, uh, experiences of men are not only gendered, but they are also diverse with respect of mar marginalization and privileged. So the message is that we have to take under consideration uh, speciality and we have to take under consideration power relations, marginalizations and privilege whenever we are talking about uh, man masculinities and migration processes. Thank you.